And then one of them spat out a homophobic slur. Um, and then I realized what had happened. I had been a victim of a, a homophobic hate crime. Um, very robust surveys in, in the UK alone show that over 50% of 12 uh, uh, to 15-year-olds and adults have seen hate in the last 12 months on social media offensive to dead name a trans person. Now, we don't know whether or not... In, in, there's a recent bit of legislative... A court case has just occurred in the UK um, with J.K. Rowling and India Willoughby. It's the economy, the higher the frustrations of certain groups, usually groups of working class people, they tend to be disproportionately affected by economic downturn. Our research did find uh, we controlled for a whole array of possible factors, including increased reporting and better recording by the police, two things that are often used by the right uh, to explain away fluctuations in hate crime, to prove that actual perpetration went up by around 1,100 crimes. Yeah. With the debate that's raging in Ireland right now, over um, hate speech laws that are coming in. And I wanted to get your perspective on this as an expert and authority on hate. <music> Professor of Criminology, Matt Williams, thank you so much for joining me. I'm really looking forward to this conversation. Thanks so much. Uh, pleasure to be here. Um, before, when we're going to talk about the science of hate, the, the fascinating and, and deeply upsetting and brilliant book that you you published um, recently, but before we do that, can we can we talk about your journey and what happened yeah. to you and and the kind of it changed something happened to you that changed the trajectory of your life? Yes, yes. What, what and, happened, Matt? And that's how I start the book. It's it, it gets the reader straight into the personal experience uh, of myself and how and how that really shaped my life for the last twenty years, really. But it was back in the late 1990s um, when I just finished studying at Cardiff University um, and I was at celebrating the end of my degree with friends in London. Um, we were drinking, eating good food, enjoying ourselves, uh, just celebrating a milestone in all our lives. And the party went on until, you know, the afternoon and the early evening. And uh, we ended up in a, a gay bar um, on Tottenham Court Road. And uh, I had stepped out of that bar to have a cigarette. Um, and as I was sort of smoking it, uh, a guy came up to me and, and asked me for a light. So I obliged. And, and before I could flick the flint on my Zippo lighter, um, I everything went black. I just, just kind of then opened my eyes and I was looking up at the guy who had asked me for the light. And I, I, had, I had no idea what was going on. Then I had this distinctive taste of, blood in my mouth you know that metallic taste and i thought i've been hit um and and then two others emerged and there was a group of them and they were all standing above me laughing and i was just dazed and confused and then one of them spat out a homophobic slur um and then i realized what had happened i had been a victim of a, a homophobic hate crime and they'd been waiting outside that bar i could gather patiently for their victim. It wasn't specifically me, but someone like me that they wanted to punish in some way, I thought at the time. Um, luckily, they moved away. They they didn't continue the violence. I, I kind of gave them their prize, if you like, um, and, and, and they kind of walked away and, and, and congratulated each other on their achievement, which was bizarre. Um, I got up and and just kind of, you know, took care of myself in the bathroom, mopped up the blood, um, carried on, didn't say anything to my friends actually until much later because I was worried that they'd want to go and retaliate in some ways. I wanted to minimize the violence. I didn't. I hate violence. Uh, but I research it for a living, but I hate violence. Um, I want to understand it, you know, but I don't want to be part of it. Um, and that stuck with me for the rest of my life. It's still it's still with me now, and it changed the direction of my my professional life. I wanted to become a journalist after finishing my degree in sociology. Um, but I had these kind of burning questions in my mind about why I was targeted that day. I, I just couldn't fathom why I was chosen um, as a victim of hatred. And the only place I thought I could find that answer is the study of criminology, understanding the motivations of my attackers could be found there. So I embarked on a degree in criminology, a master's, and then that led to a PhD, and I've spent the last 20 years researching why hate 
offenders do what they do and how we tackle that and how to minimize that the the transformation of prejudice to hate how do we stop that from happening and that's what the book is primarily about is, is trying to unpick the science behind that but my my personal life was massively affected too i at the time there was no law that protected gay people um, from hate crime that came in a few years later so i i didn't report it to the police at the time um i was also fearful of the police fearful that they might judge me for being gay they i might succumb to secondary victimization maybe i'd hear hor horrifying stories of that happening back in the 80s and 90s um so i i was kind of all alone with it apart from the, the friends i had who could support me and you know I, I felt I was robbed of intimacy after that because I, you know, I, I was terrified of showing any kind of affection in public. Um, I, I never, I don't hold my husband's hand, you know, in, in public anymore. In fact, he tried to hold my hand most recently when we were walking through the park and I had this strange aversion to it because of what that attack had left me with. So, you know, it completely reshaped me professionally and, and personally. And it's over 20 years later. When I was reading that section, I was thinking about PTSD, right? Mm. And PTSD was first diagnosed following, I think, the Vietnam War. It was around the time the Vietnam, when soldiers saw something or experienced something so shocking that they were changed. They couldn't believe human beings were capable of such a thing. And yes. I was reading your story and how your you, the, the whole of your life changed that I thought, this sounds like, did you ever get a diagnosis of PTSD? I I have wondered about it. I mean, I speak to a lot of scientists, professionals uh, from all walks of life in the book. Uh, I kind of recount what they told me about their, their research and um, their practice. And a neuroscientist did allude to the fact that I may have had PTSD from an experiment I went through with them, which I detail in, 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 in the book. Um, and from a reading about how the brain processes extreme information like experience personal experiences like violent attacks mm -hmm. it does reshape them. PTSD does does it's it seems reshape parts of the brain and it's it's a protective mechanism it's a mechanism to protect you in the future from similar situations so when you have flashbacks when you have these these almost illogical reactions to certain stimuli years after the event it's basically your brain, it's your hippocampus talking to your amygdala insula, so the memory part of the brain talking to the fight or flight response to the brain. And there's almost like a hard rewiring of, 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 of pathways between these parts of the brain that occurs in order to protect you from similar horrific situations, situations in the future. Mm -hmm. And it's possible, if, I've not had a diagnosis, but it's possible that from that attack, something happened in my brain and this is a mechanism to protect me in the future you know from similar situations should they arise luckily mm -hmm. they've not arisen since and i possibly because i've avoided situation maybe that mechanism is protecting me i mean, I, I keep yeah. my myself out of those situations i protect myself by not showing affection with other men in public uh, because of that and maybe that's why I'm, I'm I'm still around. I don't know, but it's a really good observation, and it's certainly something I visit in the book. How PTSD can result from these kinds of attacks. Yeah. Um. Okay. So you set up. You went on to set up the Hate Lab. Can you describe the, your work there? Well, throughout the journey, uh, I went through an understanding hate criminals. I I started off very traditionally with with um, offline hate if you like, hate on the streets. Um, so we would, for example, ask victims about their experiences across various characteristics, um, ethnicity, disability, sexual orientation, and so on, um, to understand the patterning of hate in a conventional sense. But as, as we were doing that research, we found that increasingly people were saying, well, actually, it's not on the streets that it's happening to me, it's online. Mm. And it's on social media, it's on um, websites, forums, etc. And uh, that's where the majority of the hate was being experienced by some people. So then comes along Hate Lab. <laughs> and this is, this is a, an initiative essentially to understand how hate has been re-engineered to operate online and how it's migrated from the street to online um, and how there's a relationship maybe back and forth um, between those two forms of hate. And of course, with the advent of things like Twitter, uh, now X, um, other platforms, um, 
hate is proliferating online in a way that I don't think we could have ever imagined. Um, and in the book, I make the point that we're probably living in a more hateful time now, but just by the number of people who are being targeted by hate than ever before, which is a controversial statement, because of course we immediately think of, of the Holocaust um, and other genocides and, and think to ourselves, well, surely it was more hateful back then. But I think in terms of the sheer number of people that are being exposed to hatred now, it's it's higher than we've ever witnessed. For example, um, very robust surveys in, in the UK alone show that over 50% of 12 uh, uh, to 15 year olds and adults have seen hate in the last 12 months on social media, half the population. And this is including kids. And that's unprecedented. And, and this is what Hate Lab is all about, trying to understand the manifestation of hate online and how it spreads very quickly, but also how we might combat it with new forms of technology like generative AI. Um, would you posit a definition for hate? So say, have you got yeah. a definition? Yes. So it's interesting because hate is used very casually. The term hate is used casually in everyday life. So you know, my, my nephew might say, I hate broccoli. Um, mm. Or my neighbor might say, oh, I hate that, that, that president or whatever it might be. And we throw it around very casually. But it's a very emotive term. Um, I would argue that the scientific study of hate doesn't really look at that kind of manifestation of it. The scientific study of it, which is based in the study of prejudice, comes from a person's aversion to a group defined however you might want to define a group it's usually an out group so it's a group that's different from you in some way that could manifest in skin color it could manifest in culture it could manifest in sexual orientation it could manifest in ability disability and so on and so forth but it's an out group that's separate from you they have different characteristics from you but all of a sudden for some reason you come to view that group negatively through stereotyping, through a bad experience, through, through misinformation, disinformation spread about that group, and you scapegoat them for some reason, for usually for a frustration that you have yourself. Maybe you're unemployed, maybe you can't get a, a, an appointment at the doctors because it's too busy, maybe you can't get uh, housing because it's, it's, it's not available, but you see other groups getting it, and all of a sudden, it's a subversion to that group that manifests and creates a prejudice. So it's, it's out-group derogation is what we're talking about. It's, I, I, it might manifest against an individual, but only because they belong to a group that you've developed this, this animosity towards. And it's, so it's intergroup intergroup relations that we're looking at when we look at hate. It's not, I hate my father for abusing me. It's not, I hate that president because he gets on. It's not, I hate broccoli. It's, it's group-based animus effectively. And that's where the majority of the science has been focused on understanding hate. And that's important because it's when groups start having this, this animus, this, this, this dislike for each other that we see social relations break down it's where ultimately at the end of that very very long road um we can find genocide um yeah. and genocides are still going on today um across the world so it's it's that is the study of hatred and the other i think the other point to make is is hate isn't really an emotion as such um, emotions can be felt alongside it like anger frustration and so on uh fear is a big part of it but hate is more of an enduring attitude so it's it's something that that sticks around, um, and it 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 it's something that shapes your world view, and it's so it's not as fleeting as an emotion might be, but they do coincide. Uh, you know, there are emotional bedfellows to hate, and and anger, frustration, fear are often felt alongside it, and they feed it, if you like. Fear feeds hate, um, anger feeds hate, frustration feeds hate. But hate is something somewhat different than an emotion. It's more enduring. Um, and so and so that's what we understand as hatred in the scientific definition. But it, it has to be a prejudice first for there to be hatred. So you have to, a lot of the effort we put into is understanding how prejudice is formed. And then the holy grail is finding out what that tipping point is from prejudice to hate. And that's what I've been spending a lot of my time doing over the past few years yeah when I, when I was listening to you talk i was thinking about two things tribalism number one tribes mm. um which would have a kind of an evolutionary natural you know absolutely we, we were we we're tribal primates but also status as well and then obviously the economic now you get into the economics in the book um when economics when, when societies are destabilized by stuff like brexit mm. um 
And just to jump there for a second, you did note that post-Brexit, there was greater than 1,000 hate crimes reported in the few days and the weeks after the Brexit vote, which was quite shocking. It's almost yeah. as if society was given permission to hate. Yes, uh, and uh, we, we call Brexit and similar kinds of events to Brexit, political votes, court cases, terror attacks, as trigger Triggers. events. Yeah. yeah, what they tend to do is is release a person's prejudice um, if they are highly prejudiced. It, it, there's an excuse for them to express it. So after Brexit, for example, um, there was this kind of message that was permeating the country in the UK that, oh, we've decided to come out of the European Union. That means foreigners are no longer going to come in and this is what the whole campaigning was about with the leave.eu campaign and and so on um and it was almost as if folks had a license to then go on to public transport and say horrific things to people different from them go onto the streets commit violent crimes and so on and our research did find uh, we controlled for a whole array of possible factors including increased reporting and better recording by the police two things that are often used by the right uh, to explain away fluctuations in hate crime, to prove that actual perpetration went up by around 1,100 crimes. And the, the argument we make in, in the research, which I detail in the book, is that in the absence of that vote, we would have seen 1,100 fewer hate crimes of that nature. So it was causal of those hate crimes. It was causal. It was a moment in time that freed up the prejudices allowed certain prejudices to be released from some people who had high prejudice into a form of communication, either verbal hate crime or physical hate crime. And um, it all is all based on the premise that we all have prejudice. That is just a fact that we've grown up in a culture that's biased. And because of that, our brain absorbs these biases from the media, parents, schools and peers like a sponge when we're growing up. And we learn negative stereotypes about groups we try to suppress these all the time because it's we've learned that through various civilizing processes like the civil rights movement the women's lib movement the gay rights movement now currently we're in this sort of trans rights movement we're in the thick of it which is pretty ugly to watch online in particular that we we learn as a society it's not appropriate to treat people different from us um in a prejudiced way we can't you shouldn't discriminate you should treat everyone equally but we're constantly trying to suppress these prejudices that lie below the surface. And when an event like Brexit happens, what we get is what, what, what scientists call justification forces that mm -hmm. kind of weaken the suppression forces. You get this justification suppression. It's like the devil and the angel on the shoulders, right? And all of a sudden, when the justification forces outweigh the suppression forces, in some people, not everybody, but in some people, that prejudice can come out. Um, and in the book, I call these forces, justification forces, accelerants. You know, you add more accelerant on top of accelerant onto a prejudiced frustration, there's a higher chance that it's going to come out. And a, a trigger event is one such accelerant that I talk about in the book. Have you guys at, at the Hague Lab, have you noticed um, a lowering in, in intensity of hate crime, given that we're, we're eight years out from the Brexit vote, the, the United Kingdom has left the European Union. What are you seeing in 2024 and 2023, if you like? Uh, I wish I could say we're seeing less, um, but we're not. Uh, hate crime is, unlike most crime, hate crime is very temporarily determined. It's determined by things that happen in time, largely. Mm. Um, so Brexit was one such thing. Um, but since Brexit, we had a string of terror attacks in 2017, Westminster Bridge, Manchester Arena, and so on. And, and we saw massive spikes in anti-Muslim hatred around those. Um, international things have happened. Um, very recently, the war in the Middle East between Israel and Gaza, of course, has seen a huge spike in anti-Semitic hate, the largest we've seen in 40 years, and a huge spike in anti-Muslim hatred in tandem. Um, and it's events like these that tend to galvanize people's negative stereotypes about certain groups and, and, and again, justification forces, allowing them to release their prejudice. So we've not really seen a decline to a, a baseline level of hate pre-Brexit. All we've seen is a ramping up of tensions over time. And I think a lot of this also has to do with politics, because what we're hearing in the UK now, unlike 
since we've seen maybe in the 50s, 60s, are tensions being stoked by mainstream politicians. And we're definitely seeing it with the Tory party right now. It's very, very desperate to try and secure votes at the next election, which looks very doubtful. But the more doubtful it looks for them... So the, the gloves will come off, you think? The gloves are going to come off. It's really, really frightening. And mm. even, of course, we've got the election in the US as well. There's other elections around the world. And everything is being ramped up. The The tensions are being ramped up. The, the far right across the world is rising. There is no question that the, the populism is back on the agenda. Um, and we're seeing it in, in countries across the world. And it, it is, quite frankly, quite frightening to witness. Um and it's it's partly about trying to gain votes. And there's also this sort of war against woke. Um, the 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 more the left and the progressive rise, the more fierce the alternative becomes. And there's a ratcheting up of of rhetoric, and then in turn a ratcheting up of community tensions. If you think about around Brexit, a lot of the drive. Um, the justification forces, the drive for those justification forces came from rhetoric from senior politicians, uh, but also figureheads of the movement, Farage, for example. Mm. When senior people say things that demonize other groups, they, they for example, demonize uh, Muslim groups, um, gay groups, trans people. Um, they, they talk about taking away rights or not affording groups' rights. That permeates down to the average person. And it seems as if, well, if Boris Johnson's saying it, if Rishi Sunak is saying it, if J.K. Rowling is saying it, if Nigel Farage is saying it, it can't be wrong. These are influential, serious, powerful people, rich people as well, and there must be something to what they're saying. Um, and that, again, justifies the expression of prejudice um, in certain cases, in certain people. And we're seeing it more and more. I've not, I've, I've, I'm not. I was quite taken aback by at the, at the Conservative Party conference last year about some of the things that were being said by very senior politicians, including Rishi Sunak, on this sort of gender trans debate um, that effectively, I think, is enabling some folks to then come out and just say what they want um, with no regard to the harm it might cause to individuals. So yeah, I think it's really important to understand how these trigger events are really also dependent upon political and popular rhetoric that's being spouted largely actually on social media. But one of, another thing that you note very importantly is the, the impact of austerity, which was a, and is a Tory policy on towns and cities in the north of England that I'm, I'm quite familiar with some of them. I, I worked in Bolton. I did a play in Bolton many years ago. I, I know the north of England to a certain extent. Um, and I've, I've seen the kind of economic struggles and the change over an extended period of time. I was in the UK from 2007 to 2010. And you can see a kind of a deterioration in, in life quality and opportunity almost that could be fueling yes. hate. Yes, the, a lot of research has been done on trying to understand if um, economic downturns, huge unemployment, housing shortages, long waiting lists for the health service feed into prejudices. Do, do those kinds of factors increase the justification forces of the expression of prejudice in the form of hate speech or hate crime? Uh, and large studies across Europe have found, in fact, that yes, the worse the economy, the higher the frustrations of certain groups, usually groups of working class people, they tend to be disproportionately affected by economic downturns. And what's happening there is they're looking for a scapegoat to blame. They have personal failings, so they they, they might lose their job, they might lose their partner in the process, mm. um, which then mesh with community frustrations. So something's happening in the community too, which is tied to obviously personal loss. So, for example, an industry might collapse in a certain town, the potteries, for example, up north, as I described in the book. Um, and in tandem with that, we have an influx of migrants coming through, um, offering cheap labor for the kinds of jobs that some folks don't want to do. For example, uh, uh, working on the land. Mm. Exactly. Um, and you get this kind of toxic mix of 
folks unemployed, migrants who are coming, who are working, but doing work that certain folks don't want to do or have stopped doing over the years. Um, the migrants coming in because um, the majority of the ones who have a better education go to London, those that have less of an education tend to go to other parts of the country. That means they don't speak English as well as yes. those in London. Mm. So you have a language barrier. So you can't start to understand ways of life without having lines of communication between mm. groups. And this, this kind of toxic mix, this tinderbox, essentially, can create an uptick in, in hate speech and hate crime in times of extreme stress. And I think the important point I make in the book is that in very stressful times, in economic downturns, uh, during political votes of, this, uh, of the nature of Brexit and so on and so forth, where people's frustrations become extreme, there needs to be a vent of some description. And if you can't rationalize in your head why this thing that's happening in your community is going on, you, you might turn to alcohol, you might turn to drugs. Um, and in those situations, your capacity for rationalization goes out the window and you're far more likely to say something you regret or, or do something um, you may or may not regret. And this is this is this this is the kind of toxic mix of factors that we see in certain parts of the country. And it's not just I don't just talk. You mentioned the north and parts of the north. Stoke on Trent, I think, is one place I talk about in the book quite extensively. I also talk about the south. Mm -hmm. So I also talk about uh, um, um, Kent and Essex and parts of of the south that also have experienced massive spikes in hate crime after the Brexit vote. It wasn't just one part of the country that we saw this it was it was actually scattered across different parts of the country and diff in london it didn't happen so much london it, 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 it didn't tend to spike as much as other parts of the country um but that's because the frustrations weren't felt as much in london because there was less inequality in london and i think that this inequality in the sense of injustice only fuels these kinds of frustrations and, and ultimately prejudice and hate and you did note that in Essex, for example, they had a very low population of immigrants um, and people coming from outside. That they 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 had a very high, quite a high vote for massive. Brexit. It was huge. Yeah, it, it's in it's one of the highest voting regions actually, um, with Stoke on Trent and a few others. Mm. Um, and it's a fascinating it's a fascinating um, relationship actually. It's almost as if having a population that's say almost 50 50 um in terms of migrants and non-migrants um creates situations for hate but also environments where folks from outside are so few mm -hmm. that it's so alien to have people unlike you around the town that it becomes very obvious that they're there so there's the sweet spot is um somewhere between 50 50 and and very very few uh, and then there's a sense of integration that, that can can happen um when there's too few others so to speak whatever they but that, or that other might be or what might be perceived as too many i.e sort of a 50 50 split which is mm. probably the highest in some in some regions then then those are the two dangerous points for 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 frustration but in one case the local folk are just not used to having difference around them. And in the other extreme, um, there's this sense that um, there are too many outsiders now and the town is changing. Um, it's something in between um, creates what we call very often positive contact, where, where there are interactions that are frequent enough for familiarity to breed and liking to start to occur um but it, it seems that the research suggests that the polar opposites of those tend to be quite quite dangerous and, and conducive to the formation of prejudice or the expression of prejudice yeah you mentioned in the book there's a hierarchy um it's, it's almost like maslow's hierarchy of needs this kind of pyramid structure there are seven steps i think if i remember yes. correctly that you, that you spoke about um when we you mentioned there the um the social media uh, effect um in your view and in, in the work that the hate lab is doing is 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 social media and the apps and the platforms exacerbating and fueling 
or are they just vehicles to, to register yeah. things? What is the effect yeah. going on? So in that pyramid, it's it, it's interesting you mentioned these two things in, in tandem. In the pyramid, the very bottom of the pyramid mm -hmm. is what is called anti-locution. So this is kind of bad speech in effect. And by the way, this pyramid structure is is not developed by myself. It's developed by, developed by a pretty famous uh, scientist in this space called Gordon Allport, oh, who was Gordon, working yeah. in the 1950s in the States and had gone through uh, sort of lynchings in, in the US at the time, but also... Um, had, had, had fled Europe um, following the Holocaust, and he was consumed by understanding why stuff like this could happen. Um, and he developed uh, that pyramid in his work, The Nature of Prejudice, which is a very famous work in the field. Um, and the bottom of that is anti elocution So it starts off by, by bad speech or hate speech, if you like. Um, and I would argue that social media is a facilitator of that bad speech. I don't necessarily think that it makes good people bad, but I do think it makes bad people worse. Um, and it enables the propagation of hate speech. It enables the production of hate speech. There's something interesting about the internet, and we've studied this since the 80s at Cardiff University. Actually, we pioneered it here in Cardiff Uni. Um, and it's it's called what we, in psychological terms, disinhibition. Um, a bit like when you drink too much alcohol, um, you become disinhibited. You say things you wouldn't normally say when sober. The internet has a similar effect on our psychology. We feel disinhibited by things like the perceived distance between Spoke you and your... Absolutely, yeah. So you think you're you're miles away from the person that you're talking to. You're anonymous in many situations. Um, you also feel like there's a lack of potential consequence over what you're going to say because it's not regulated in the same way as if you were to say something in the pub. You know, the landlord or the other patrons would say to you, "Get out!" If you were if you're saying something that was not acceptable on social media, there just seems to be a lack of consequence, which is largely true, I think, even today. Mm. Um, so it enables enables people to produce hate speech more more readily. Uh, but I would say that those kinds of people already sending hate speech will probably say it to their friends in close so in, in close contact anyway. I'm not saying it makes them bad in that way. It just facilitates it. Well, but they then have a megaphone. The other... They now yes, have a megaphone. Uh, yeah, have a megaphone. They feel freed up to, to say it because of all the disinhibition they're experiencing. Mm. But also what's important to state about social media is the algorithmic amplification of this content. And ever the interesting, I mean, the, I don't think the likes of Zuckerberg, Dorsey, who used to run Twitter, even Musk, maybe, although Musk, I do question, um, set out with an evil plan to create hate machines. Okay, they they didn't set out to do that. In fact, I think their vision was one of a utopian vision of the more we bring disparate groups and people together across the world, the more tolerance they will be. Uh, and they're not wrong on that. Gordon Allport, as I mentioned earlier, also devised this theory of contact, positive contact. And the idea there is the more we have positive contact with people different from us, the fewer prejudices that we have because negative stereotypes come crashing down because they're not really based in reality. And we realize that people different from us have the same trials and tribulations and desires. We're just, they're just like us. There's more that, that, that we have more in common than what separates us. Um, and that, that's that been proven in over 250,000 people in over 30 countries in multiple studies to be a fact. You know, it is it does work. And the assumption was that social media was going to be this mass positive contact machine and it would bring people together and it would it would create tolerance and understanding. What they forgot was the positive part of positive contact. They achieved contact in the billions but not all of it was positive. And in fact, algorithms started to learn that certain types of information kept users' attention for longer. That included things like dog and cat videos doing cute things, obviously, you know, who doesn't love them? Mm -hmm. But what the algorithms also learned was that extreme stuff kept us glued. It's like when we travel past an accident on the motorway. You don't want to look at the accident. You just don't want to look, but you always do at that last minute. You try to get that quick glance. And it, basically, you mentioned evolution earlier on. This comes from our evolutionary 
uh, um, obsession, if you like, with identifying threat. The reason that we're on this planet and we dominate our planet as a species is because we are super threat detecting creatures. We have developed an amazing ability to detect threat. And we have parts of our brain, like the amygdala, which is the fight or flight part of the brain, that can detect threat in milliseconds. And the reason you know, why, why we're still here and still we dominate the planet and is because of that. But it's an ancient part of the brain that's no longer needed in the same way now, but it still works in the same way. And we still look out for bad stuff because we think it might be a threat to our survival. This is why we're obsessed with bad news. This is why news programs always repeat the same bad news over and over again. It keeps us glued. And it's why social media promotes rather inadvertently through definitely through algorithms. It's not through a decision that Musk says, I want to promote the hate. It's the deep learning algorithms that have learned that we watch this bad stuff for longer. And the longer we watch that bad stuff, the more they can advertise to us. The longer we keep scrolling, we've got doom scrolling, you know, scroll, 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 more and more bad stuff, bad stuff, bad, keeps us keeps us attached to it because we're looking for threat to avoid it. Um, and the deep learning algorithms have learned that evolutionary part of our existence and have basically tapped into it. Of course, Musk, Zuckerberg, and the rest could turn off those engagement algorithms. And in fact, they have done in the past. But what happens? Their profits plummet because we stop looking. Their users stop scrolling. Um, and dog and cat videos aren't enough to keep us looking at the platforms. The bad stuff needs to be there. Uh, and so they profit from hate and they profit from extremism. Um, and you turn that off and they lose a lot of money. And this is a really difficult spot we find ourselves in. This intractable yeah. problem of how do these companies justify to their, their shareholders that you know turning off the algorithm to stop promoting the hate um, for the good of humanity uh, means that you have to take a massive hit in your pocket. And this is the, this is the current situation we're in. So social media, frees us up to say hateful things um, via the disinhibition effect. But then the algorithms learn that this stuff is sticky. Hate is sticky. It'll keep people on the platform. So it'll just keep promoting it. And even though, you know, sometimes the platforms will tweak this and that, they will try to try to deprioritize certain bits of content that is too extreme. If they do it too much, they start seeing their profits drop. So this is the intractable problem we have right now. Yeah. Um, plus, you, you you recounted a story about Myanmar and um, when Facebook was um, introduced to to Myanmar, there was there was a, a, a terrible. It fueled a terrible tragedy over a short period of time. People weren't used to having um, you know, Facebook. Um, yeah. There's another story you talk about um, when Microsoft introduced Tay. What happened yes. when Tay was introduced? Both of these are a bit like natural experiments. It's horrible to use that term in relation to Myanmar in particular because of the, the genocide of the Rohingya minority there is extensive. Um, mm. 700,000 Rohingya minority displaced, hundreds of thousands killed. The demonization, the dehumanization of that minority, all facilitated by Facebook. Um, both the UN and Amnesty International stated that um, you know Facebook had a determining role in that genocide because there was so much content on that platform that was literally dehumanizing the minority Rohingya, calling them cockroaches, parasites, and there was next to no moderation of that content because Facebook didn't have folks that could speak the local dialect in their moderation teams, and they 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 basically neglected to build that function quick enough. Um, and the whole fact that, you know, you know, in over a space of a year that you know, over, like, almost no one in Myanmar had access to Facebook because no one had mobile phones and a legislation change meant that all of a sudden half the population had phones and half the population had Facebooks. But there was no media literacy in the sense that they didn't understand what and was real or not on the platform you know we understand what mis and disinformation is now we've become aware of the fact that it exists and we we, are, we teach our kids to be critical and reflective of the stuff that they see you know everything you see online is true 
Meanwhile, there was no literacy of that nature at the time because they'd never had this kind of technology before. And it was too rapid in terms of its penetration into society. And it became a weapon um, for genocide. And Facebook actually put its hand up and said, yeah, we admit that we were did we did wrong there. And that was it. I mean, there was, I mean, there was no further consequence at all. And I'm still amazed that that actually happened. And it still happens in parts of Africa now. Uh, where violence, ethnic violence is occurring, you know, on a daily basis being facilitated by social networks. Um, and Tay is an interesting example of, of how unregulated technology can go wild if you don't tame it. Um, and this is relevant to AI right now, of course, as well. Um, but Tay was a chatbot, a form of AI that was released by Microsoft. Um, and uh, it was trained on language, much like open uh, AI's chat GPT is trained on language, um, to speak like a human in response to questions that you might ask it. It was launched on Twitter. Um, and within 24 hours, it was radicalized. Um, it started to spout out racist and homophobic content. It, it said something transphobic about Caitlyn Jenner, I think it was. Um, it said something uh, uh, in regards to Ricky Gervais and about Hitler. And it just just started to say very questionable things learned very quickly it did how to hate yeah if you if you imagine um taking the whole of twitter and training a machine to act like a human based on what's said on twitter it's mm. going to be a pretty grim mm. representation of a human twitter is not representative i'd say of the average human dialect and if you just train a machine off of something like twitter you're going to get a very particular kind of dialect a very particular kind of version of humanity and um this is what happened to tay um interestingly though in china at the same time there was another chatbot created called zauchi and this chatbot was trained off of chinese internet which is heavily censored at least yeah. um it massively censored and I'm not, I'm not arguing for censorship at all i'm an advocate for free speech because i think you need free speech to fight hate speech but in China, it created a natural experiment of sorts. And that chatbot was perfectly well behaved. It didn't say anything remotely racist or homophobic. It was very obedient, very polite, um, primarily because it was trained on a very different kind of data. It was that very censored, moderated data from within China. That chatbot still exists today. That wasn't taken. I think it's got over a billion followers now on, on WeChat, I think is the equivalent of, say, Twitter in China. Um, and ultimately, it just shows you that you train a machine on language on Western Twitter versus Chinese, a Chinese version of the platform, and you get very different outputs when one is highly moderated, too much, I'd say, and the other is left free to learn from the worst of humanity. Um, and this says a lot about AI models that we're currently seeing develop, large language models and open AI, Llama, Gemini with Google, um, and the huge amounts of effort that these companies are going to have to go to to make sure that these data sets are not biased. Um, and another example in the book I use is Google where- Google autocomplete, right? Uh, yes, yes. So for a long, long time, autocomplete would suggest pretty racist or homophobic things to the user i mean there was a lot of a lot of coverage of this uh you know 2019 where you'd say you type in an order to complete blacks are um and then it would come up with a bunch of racist suggestions like blacks are lazy blacks are criminals um you type in gays are um and it would come up with a whole host of homophobic suggestions because Google Autocomplete learns from what people are typing in. So if you've got lots of racist and homophobic people typing in suggest, you know, their, their search terms, Google will learn, oh, okay, you must be searching for a similar thing to that person. But it's not been told that, well, that's not appropriate for the platform. Uh, another really interesting study was conducted on, again, the whole of the internet in terms of all the text that's available to try and find out if there was any difference in the ways in which, say, typically white names were were associated with good or bad terms like lazy or, or or successful or rich and poor and how typical black names uh, were associated with the same terms and this is a replication of what's 
term the implicit association test, which is developed by Harvard University, which is a way of sneakily working out whether or not you have a preference for white people over a preference for black people. Um, and it was implemented across the whole internet to try and find out if white names were more likely to be associated with, with good terms and black names with bad terms. And in fact, what it doesn't it wouldn't surprise you to find that indeed, yes, what names like Tyrone and so on were, were very often associated with bad terms like criminal and lazy. Names like um, Tom and Matt were associated with intelligence and uh, generosity, and empathy and, and so on and so forth. So the content that's on the internet that's training these models is biased because we are biased as human beings and we're putting this stuff on the internet. So we've got to be very, very careful about making any any inference from these AI models without strict balances put in place to check to check for these biases. Um, I, I'm sure you're familiar. Um, you may be familiar with the debate that's raging in Ireland right now over um, hate speech laws that are coming in. And I wanted to get your perspective on this as an expert and authority on hate. But the legislation is in our parliament to um, basically create hate speech laws that that and, and there's protected classes so protected characteristics they're called so gender is yes. one sex race etc 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 there's a lot of pushback right now happening over here because people are concerned that a there's no definition of hate right in the legislation so hate can mean any damn thing the government decides it means um but it, it may impact freedom of speech and the, the, the freedom to criticize. So mm. say, for example, and, and I suppose one of the, at the forefront of the, the conversation is the trans debate. Yes. Right. What's your perspective, A, on hate speech laws? Yeah. And then as, as they relate to freedom of speech and how we actually keep having these conversations that people feel are important. The same is going on in Scotland right now. Scotland has yeah. just introduced similar legislation. Interestingly, just for context, we've had legislation on this in England and Wales for a long time. Um, they're called the stirring up offences um, in one category. So it, it prevents the stirring up of hatred against certain categories like race, religion, sexual orientation. Um, so to stir up hatred, you have to repeatedly try to convince another person to hate. So the, the, the bar there is very high. Um, it's not a one-off statement on social media that would, would reach that threshold. It has to be very high. Um, the other uh, provisions that we have are in, with, in the Communications Acts in England and Wales, which also cover Scotland, actually, um, where it's illegal to cause gross offence to another person, um, which is way more than just offence offense causing an offense um is perfectly legitimate um where we should be able to offend each other that's part of freedom of expression and it's protected in the european convention of human rights uh which we are we we abide by in the in the uk and as the eu in ireland um so the balance that the legislators have to make in ireland but also because we're part of the same legislation in europe scotland and england and wales and northern ireland um is protecting certain groups from hate speech while maintaining the right of freedom of expression and and where that where that line lies is where the, all their anxiety is coming from and i get that and it has to be dealt with very very carefully not having a definition of hate is is in itself problematic and i think there will be a definition of hate at some point but it may not be made until another authority in ireland decides what that is in the uk the definition of hate, which is then implemented by the police, is developed by the Crown Prosecution Service. And the way they define it is by stating hostility towards an identity, a protected identity. What that hostility looks like mm. is usually decided in the court and by a jury of one's peers. So the and Crown Prosecution a, would have to would have to say, okay, that meets the threshold. Yes. Right. But it, it but the threshold will then be followed up by a lot of guidance on what uh, a prosecutor should be looking for. So when it comes to social media content in particular, mm. there are certain considerations they 
they think. I've, I've put a post on LinkedIn about this recently, actually, because I was talking about the legislation in Scotland. So first of all, it has to be either causing gross offence for it to be to go forward, not just offensive. But what gross offence is again is up for debate. Um, if it's that's not defined, Matt, is it is gross defence offence? No, defined? it's not. It's defined in court. So this okay. stuff is usually then defined in court. But usually, the gross offence means it has to it has to be the average person on the street, as they define it. This is how it's usually defined. The average person on the street has to think that's grossly offensive not merely offensive. So insulting someone is fine. Mm. Okay. Disagreeing with someone is absolutely fine. But it may be grossly offensive to dead name a trans person. Now, we don't know whether or not... In, in, there's a recent bit of legisl a court case has just occurred in the UK um, with J.K. Rowling and India Willoughby, um, where J.K. Rowling was dead naming India Willoughby on social media. It went to court. And the ruling came out that it was not hate speech and that dead naming didn't count because uh, the gender critical camp of this debate, which is opposing the trans rights camp, has a right to freedom of expression and dead naming a trans person is their right of freedom of expression. OK, and this has just been decided in court. So what we'll find in Ireland and Scotland are similar cases coming before the courts and the courts will decide on what's appropriate or not. And it's a kind of that seemingly democratic process where the people get to decide i.e in the form of juries but also in the form of magistrates and judges what is appropriate in relation to this legislation so it takes time to tease out what this looks like and there's a there's faith in the process i guess um i am slightly uneasy with the ruling that came out um because i know a lot of trans people and i know how dead naming harms them um, and invalidates them. Um, and as a gay man, I've come from an experience, a very particular kind of experience where I've felt similar kinds of pains in the past. And I see, I know how debasing they are. Um, but that was a decision made in the court of law. And, and that's what we currently have in the UK. But this just gives you an example of how this legislation goes from something that might seem quite woolly in in the in the document itself to then how the courts have to decide based on the wisdom of the crowd if you like which comes in the form of a jury or the form of judges or magistrates who decide then what is and what isn't on that side or that side but ultimately there's a lot of protect there's a lot of guardrails on this kind of legislation a lot of guardrails because of that uh, convention on human european convention on human rights for the freedom of expression so ultimately a lot of so if if there was a social media hate post, so to speak, and it was reported, the prosecutor would have to think, right, was this actually targeted at the victim? Was it intended to reach the victim? Or was it just generally just said? If it wasn't targeted at the victim, then maybe it's less serious. Did the person who sent it immediately take it down? Did they show remorse over sending it? That's another factor they'll take into account or whether or not it's in the public interest to proceed with a prosecution. What was the reach of the post? Did the post get seen by hundreds of thousands or just five or six people? That will have an effect on whether it's in the public interest to proceed. Um, was the person a minor? Does the person have a mental illness of some description? So many guardrails are put around this legislation and the eventual implementation of it that I'm actually quite comfortable with the current hate speech laws that we have in England and Wales. And you're, you're going to get something similar in Ireland and it's just been implemented in Scotland. So I think this moral panic that's being stirred up by certain parts of the media, certain individuals, um, ignores the finer detail of how this legislation manifests. And I have trust in the process um, because I know what these legislators, how careful they are when drafting this legislation. And then I have wisdom that juries that end up listening to these cases make, will make the right choice. You think it in, in your conversations, for example, with the trans community, that there would be an argument to say, look, it is the price in a liberal democracy of living and existing in a liberal democracy. Sometimes our feelings, all of our feelings are hurt. That that that, that freedom of speech, I like freedom of speech because I like to know where people are. You know, yeah. and if we, 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 we like to know, I like to know where the people with extreme views are. Yeah. What corner of the internet they exist, um, yeah. et cetera, et cetera. You know, that kind of way. And if yeah. you do yeah. anything yeah. to impinge, you will push mm. them into the shadows and push them deeper and deeper. 
and I don't like that makes me very un uncomfortable. Yes, it's a really good observation, and, and you're completely right. When I when I've seen certain individuals removed off of Facebook and Twitter um, because of the things that have been saying, they just pop up on underground platforms and which are unregulated. And you're right, you you get this displacement effect. They're displaced from the mainstream into the into the fringe, uh, where they can probably have. Uh, more uh, power and damage because you know they're just listening. But they're just kind of in a, in a uh, an echo chamber of of like minded folks, so they become even more radicalized, possibly even worse. We've seen this, I think, unfortunately, with J.K. Rowling. I think she, I think the way in which J.K. Rowling was talking about trans people three years ago is very different to how she's talking about them now, and it's it's like she's doubled down on on the whole thing. Um, from my and uh, my personal kind of viewpoint in reading the content that she puts out there, uh, and no, she's not been removed from the platform for what she's saying. And interestingly, the, the trans debate is one of those areas where platforms are more reluctant to remove content um, because Why do you think it's that is? It, because we're in the civilizing process of it. So it, mm -hmm. we had the the civil rights movement we had the women's live movement we had the gay rights movement which did include trans people at the time um obviously in fact trans people were pioneering in that movement but it i don't think they achieved the same kind of advancements as lesbian gay and bisexual folk um who were not trans um and it's happening now um and it's ugly um and it's largely i think people uh, you know the 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 mass perception of it is it is undecided when a, which side you come down on, there's still no no one's won yet. No one's won this debate yet. Um, there will be a winner at some point, um, but no one's won this debate yet. It may take a bit longer than the others um, because it, gender is something really fundamental to us. I know race and sexual orientation is fundamental, but gender is an interesting one because it really upsets people when you mess with it. Um, it freaks us out when you start messing with gender. When you see a man dressed as a woman or a woman dressed as a man, or there's there's male or female traits in the opposite in the sex that they're you know not not born with, it 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 does something to us quite fundamental. Um, and and experiments of sort of psychological experiments prove that when you mess with perceptions of gender, it really it makes people uncomfortable. It, and a lot of homophobia is actually more about gender than it is about sexual orientation it's more about men acting like women or the perception that they will act like women and vice versa women will act like men that's what that's what upsets homophobes more than anything else it's not necessarily the sexual orientation as such it's the, it's, the, it's how it's bound up with gender and, and gender stereotypes um and so we're in the we're in the throw of, throws of that on social media and it's it's deeply ugly um and platforms are not regulating in the same way because they don't know what side is going to win um and i also think that those engaging in maybe you might call it anti-trans rhetoric are not the usual suspects as well they're not the usual racist homophobes that we're used to targeting on social media a lot of these folks seem like really reasonable people um and this also makes the whole debate more complicated and difficult to understand. And, and just to give you an example of this, we, in the hate lab, we build machine classifiers to identify hate speech. So machine classifiers work out how humans think about speech. And we do that by getting humans in a room, they look at a bunch of tweets, say, for example, and they tell us if they think it's hateful or not. And the, the tweets that get the most agreement we then say three out of four, four out of four people agree that that's hateful. Um, that we feed to the machine and say, look, humans agree that that's hateful. So learn what that is. Uh, they, and they agree that that's not hateful. So look at that and agree what, you know, and then learn from those two, two examples what hate speech is. And the machine can then approximate a human by about 90% accuracy. It's very easy to do that with race, very easy to do it with misogyny, very easy to do it with homophobia. Um, it's very hard to do that with trans identity right now, anti-trans rhetoric, because people cannot decide what is anti-trans and what is not. And if humans can't decide, i.e. There, there's, no, there's very rarely do we get agreement. Mostly it's, there's two people saying it's not and two people saying it is. We get a 50-50 split. And you can't give that to a machine because a machine can't make its mind up then. 
So ultimately, our machine classifiers for anti-trans content are not very well performing because we can't get humans to agree. And this is this is a reflection on a micro level of our little technical problem we have in the lab. It reflects society at large. Um, and we're in that process right now. I did. A, I had a look at a lot of J.K. Rowling's tweets, and you're absolutely right. The three years ago, a lot of what she was talking about seemed perfectly mild and reasonable questioning of, say, mm. um, but then she attracted an enormous amount of hate, and and it was ferocious. Yes, and. Would you monitor hate from the side of perceived victims, if you like, those those groups who would be perceived as victims, but they're pushing out hate as well? Yes. Yeah, it's interesting. Even after Brexit, for example, we had people on sort of the more progressive side hating on the people who voted to go out. So, you know, mm, yeah. hate can come from both sides. We talk about far right all the time, but we also have the far left and we get hate in that extreme to any extreme mm. of this political spectrum can result in prejudice and hatred. It, it comes from somewhere and it, it, we tend to tend to focus on one type um, or the liberal media tend to focus on one type. Um, but ultimately, of course, scientifically, it comes from both ends. And this is what we call cumulative extremism. So when one side says something, the other side attacks, the response from the original uh, person usually gets a bit more extreme and when you get this to and froing to and froing to and froing it's cumulative and it's the an extremism escalation. increases it's yeah. an escalation and both sides start to double down you see it in in war you know it's yeah. it's a human condition and this is and there has to be at some point a recognition that this is happening by both parties and that we have to quit it otherwise we'll annihilate each other you know and in a war situation that's that's what we what could happen in this situation on twitter um you know it's it's not going to end in that way but it just gets worse and worse and worse and worse and you in this cumulative extremism when you get sort of two polarizing you get polarization you get two polar positions repeatedly over dozens of different examples and experiments you've seen it happen over and over and over again um, and there's this sort of doubling that you see it with Jordan Peterson as well, I think is a recent um, interview with him um, on a, a podcast, which has been with, with video. And I think I was watching it last night. I can't remember the guy who was interviewing him. Um, but Jordan Peterson seems to have himself gone down a, a rabbit hole. I, he's a very smart man. Um, never really agreed with everything he says, but it used to be very logical. In in this in this particular debate, he seems to lose it quite often. And again, the, the the interviewer says, "I think what happened here is very reasonable." Interviewer is that he's been attacked so much by the progressive left that he's doubled down and he's losing he's losing his ability to rationalize and argue as well as he used to. And it's just going for it now. And it just sounds like soundbite after soundbite. He sounds more like a a politician than a scientist. And I think this is what we're tending to see with these sort of this increasing polarization on social media. Um, I don't know where it's going to end. I'm not, I mean, folks start to lose the the ability to claim that they're, they're reasonable people, you know, unfortunately for JK Rowling now, I think that while I was willing to accept maybe some of the arguments that, that she was making years ago as, as potentially debatable things that we should be talking about, that you know she has the right to say these things and we should talk about them um in an open liberal democracy that's that's what we should be doing some of the things she's saying now i would argue are beyond the pale for me um and uh it's 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 a different kind of rhetoric from what what i saw a few years ago yeah a, a few years ago i think um it, 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 people are people are fortifying their positions now like you said they're becoming more yes. and more entrenched um it, yes, it, it yes. will go it will reach ahead before i let you go i want to ask you about solutions but there was one solution that i was thinking of last night um like the greek method the greek old greek style of everybody going into a chamber sitting around i think is it called logos or no or no anyway it escapes me but it's where people 
get into a theater, they battle each other with words. Yes. And the winner of the, you know, and that's how you do it. Yes. Like this seems so obviously that as, as one solution, but you have, a, you have solutions that you talk about towards the end of the book as well. Um, and ways to, to handle. Yes. Things. I, I have a, I have a, a neat set of steps, <laughs> which is far too neat to, act, you know, practically be implemented in a sense, but it's a way of, of conveying to the reader that, you know, what are the scientific suggestions for reducing prejudice and stopping prejudice from turning into hate? Uh, one I've already mentioned, which is um, positive contact. The more positive contact that we have with people different from us, uh, the less prejudice we are. Um, studies have shown, for example, you know, if you grow up with people different from you, if you go to school with a very mixed uh, um, body, pupil body, um, you're far less likely to come out racist or homophobic in adulthood. Um you can even see this in brain scanners. So there, there's some, we haven't talked about brain scanners, but in the book, I talk extensively about, you know, how, what the brain is doing when a prejudiced thought is being processed or when a person sees a black or a white face on a computer screen. Mm -hmm. And some people's amygdalas flash up um, like a Christmas tree when they see a black face, but not a white face. And what's happening there, it's, it's a learned, it's a learned prejudice manifesting. But you put a kid in a scanner who's been to a mixed school and that doesn't happen. And that's fascinating. The fact that the brain isn't registering a black face as a potential threat because they've been exposed to a lot of black and Asian kids when growing up in school. So one of the fundamental things I say is if possible, mix kids as young as possible. But I've got a, a head teacher who's a good old friend of mine from university who says, Matt, I, I work in a part of the, the country where there's, they're pretty much all white. There's not one black kid in my school. So how do I achieve that? And there are alternative ways of doing it. So, for example, being exposed to literature, being exposed to stories that feature people different from you can achieve a similar kind of outcome. And there's a really interesting part of the book where I talk about the, the role of Mo Salah joining Liverpool Football Club yeah. in 2017. Um, and this, he's an example of positive contact, but not direct contact. Uh, Mo Salah joined Liverpool Football Club during the spate of terror attacks, uh, ISIS terror attacks. So anti-Muslim hate was at this highest level recorded in England and Wales. Mo Salah um, is a Muslim um, and he's very vocal about his Muslim identity. He actually portrays his Muslim identity on the pitch. Um, he often appears with his wife who has a headscarf. His daughter's called Mecca. It's, there's no question that Mo Salah's Muslim. Um, there was some anxiety about him joining the Liverpool Football Club at this point in time, that there was going to be a lot of anti-Muslim chants in Anfield and, you know, or by Liverpool fans, but also fans on opposing teams. What transpired was after he actually joined Liverpool Football Club, there was a decline in anti-Muslim hate on the streets of Merseyside. Well, he did score about... 36 goals that season. He was, you, you mentioned yeah. it, like it was some insane amount of goals. So. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, he won yes. the golden boot. He won. Yeah, yeah, he was like he was like an unbelievable uh, addition to the team, of course. Mm. Um, so, you know, but hate crimes in Merseyside dropped by 16 percent. Hate speech on social media dropped by 50 percent. And it was an unprecedented effect. And this was proven by a researcher at Stanford University. So it was a good university. And the and the and the, and the um, scientist was an econometrician. So they're really good with stats. So this is a really convincing result. But what happened there was effectively he was portraying Muslim identity in a very positive light. He was a positive role model because he was so bloody good at football and he turned, uh, you know, the fortunes around for, for Liverpool Football Club. So much so that the fans in Anfield could be heard chanting in favour of Islam. They had chants where they were praising Islam, saying they'd go to a mosque if, 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 if it'll get them more, go you know, it was, and they're doing it in the pubs in Merseyside. There's YouTube videos of, of them praising Allah, praising Muslims, praising Mo, uh, uh, Mo Salah. You'd never imagine it. And it was incredible. And, and ultimately what we saw was a positive stereotype of someone different from the majority of, of, of Liverpool football fans had a distinct effect on the expression of prejudice in that region. Interestingly, all around, prejudice was growing up against, against Muslims. And in fact, Mo did get a lot of hate from opposing fans um, because he was so bloody good. So for them, he was, wasn't a great stereotype. Um, 
But ultimately, as soon as his performance dipped the year after, the effect disappeared. So we can't rely on our sports stars and our celebrities to do all the hard work for us. You know, we have to embed this kind of positive contact in everyday life. And we do that by doing it through story, by doing it through curriculums in schools um, and reading more about the lives of others and trying to generate empathy. It's not an easy thing to do. It's a really hard thing to do because we're not hardwired to do that. We're hardwired to gather with people just like us. You know, this groupishness that we have is an evolved characteristic because the more we cooperated with people similar to us as hunter-gatherers, the more likely we survived. And that's been hardwired into us. But there's nothing negative about that. It has to be weaponized to become negative. And to learn to interact with people different from us is a difficult thing for us to do, but we should be trying our best to do it. So exposure, um, not every Muslim that moves to a community is Mo Salah. Right. And it's going to make that right. level of a contribution. But I, yes. when I was reading that piece, I was thinking about, well, there is another lesson here. You can make a micro contribution. Mm. You could go into, the, I mean, even knocking on your neighbor's door and presenting a, a, a bouquet of flowers or, or a cake yes. or something. All of a sudden, oh, because, you, mm. you know, people are inherently mm. polite. Yes. And, you know, if you just can do it more a little bit and we, we, we can all do it for each other in the community. You know, um, I, I'm going to sound like, uh, you know, love, kindness, happiness and everything. But, but that basically is the yeah. at, at the core of it. Look, it's our default, right? I mean, yeah. simple acts of kindness uh, cost nothing. And very moving as well. Absolutely. And it can be arresting when someone is kind to you. If you tip that little bit extra to the person different from you in a restaurant, if you yeah. give a compliment to a person you might not normally do. I mean, it makes all the difference. And it, inherently, humans avoid hurting other humans we don't it doesn't come naturally to us to say kill another human it's something that takes a lot for us to get to that point to you know there's there, yeah. The, yeah it's evidence from world war ii that the majority of people who fired their rifles uh, didn't fire them at their human targets they were firing them at artillery and walls and you they know? learned but, right and you talk about this how they learned by the vietnam war yes Oh yeah, yeah, and so very, so the general the the, gen the generals found out that you know the the soldiers weren't shooting at their their human targets, which essentially meant that the war could have been over quicker if they were. Um, and by the time of the Vietnam War, lots of psychological programs on dehumanization uh, um, ultimately turned soldiers into killing machines. Yeah. And eighty percent of the soldiers, ninety percent of the soldiers of the Vietnam War shot their human targets. It, but it takes a lot of programming to get us to see the enemy as less than human, which which is what is needed to kill them or to harm them, be violent against them. Mm. By default, we find that very, very, very hard to do. Um, but in order to kind of break down any prejudices that have been been formulated during socialization, if we've not been mixed with people different from us, it takes us a bit of effort being nice to people you might not normally be nice to act small acts of kindness as a starting position professor matt williams thank you so much the, the the book is fantastic it's endlessly fascinating it's deeply upsetting in points we you go through a lot of case studies yeah. um yeah so just people beware beware but it is a thoroughly fascinating read and um, i'm going to put a link to it in the description um in the description box so jump on and, and buy it thank you so much Really thank you so much. I really enjoyed that. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Thank you.